Jennings sitting in for Pauline, the host of Musician Talk. Thanks for tuning in. My guest this week is Mike Legfield, a townie from a wonderful musical family. Mike graduated from Northfield High School and earned music degrees from St. Olaf College and the University of Minnesota. Here, he performed as a tuba player in their bands and orchestras and also sang in some of the choirs. As a brass player, he has played with the Up North Brass Quintet, the Cannon Valley Regional Orchestra, the Lake Wobegon Brass Band, the Sheldon Theater Brass Band, and many others. Drawn to all things bass clef, he learned the bass guitar in college and has been playing with the Zillionaires, the Mark Allen Project, Peter Diggins and Friends, and Sister Productions. He also plays regularly at the Northfield United Methodist Church. Mike has taught instrumental music at Cannon Falls High School. Mike is fortunate to have married another town, Tanya, who is a very talented actress and singer. They have one son, Kai, who is also a musician. There's a lot to dive into, so let's speak with Mike Langford. Mike, it's fantastic to have you on the program. Thanks for having me, Steve. We would love to start this conversation with the COVID topic. And for you in particular, being a public school educator, among many other things, I'd like to know how has this affected you? And how has this affected your teaching of music? Wow. Um, going for the jugular right away there, Steve. <laughs> uh, COVID has been hard. And I, I don't think I realized how difficult it was going to be mentally and emotionally last spring and even into the summer. And then when the school year was getting started up and we had all of these crazy hoops we had to jump through for safety, you know, like everybody's six feet apart and you have to have your face covered and, and you have to do all these other safety protocols and have bottles of disinfectant everywhere and heaven knows what, a, oh, and bell covers for all of our instruments. And uh, that was very difficult and the guidelines would change every other week. And then we would check on different state websites and they'd be giving us conflicting information. So um, I, I yanked out a little bit more of my hair. Spring, I was kind of thinking, oh, you know, we'll be, we'll be back in school in a month or maybe even less. And that didn't happen. And the distance learning thing is uh, a very poor substitute for live and in person. Were there any like silver linings, any any little light bulbs that went off in your educational experience because of COVID? Not really. Okay. Maybe just realizing that, oh, yeah, uh, if absolutely necessary, I can connect with people online. I think last spring we were just kind of trying to get through it and, and muddle through it. And um, I felt really pretty awful for last year's senior class. Uh, I can't even imagine what that was like <clears throat> this year when we did uh, uh, the distance learning for November and December and into early January, uh, I did band lessons with each of my students and it was just a, you know, 10 or 15 minute individual slot. And in many cases it was just not a lot of playing and a lot of personal connecting. I felt, I felt good about that. Uh, so, musically, I don't think we've made a lot of progress okay. during this time. But to be able to connect one-on-one -on -one with yes. individuals, that was a plus. Yep, that was definitely a plus. And Cannon Falls did a really great uh, high school graduation ceremony last year, and it's just small enough of a school that we could make it work. Each student was allowed two cars worth of family members to come into the parking lot, and then they had a stage, and uh, the speakers were up there, and so it was kind of like a drive-in movie thing, <laughs> and it was, a, it was a really nice and different way to, to honor the senior class, and then they had a parade through town, 
that was really special. And I think it was a great way of taking some lemons and making some pretty sweet lemonade. And was that faculty or students or uh, administration that helped kind of come up with this idea? Uh, administration. As far as I know, this was the, the brainchild of uh, the administration, probably in particular the high school, middle school principal, Tim Hodges. And that was really cool. And then for this, for the last year's senior class, it just so happened that if you took all of them, they pretty much covered each instrument in the band. Oh. So I had them <clears throat> come in and we used GarageBand and we recorded Pomp and Circumstance one instrument at a time. <laughs> and then I filled in the gaps, like I played third trombone and bass guitar and euphonium, but otherwise every other instrument was covered. And that was a really great experience as well. And you can't script that kind of planning, can you? Nope. Nope. Well, Mike, you just gave us a little bit of information on the, the variety of instruments that you actually play, including low brass instruments and the yep. electric bass. Can you take us through childhood musical experience? What got you started? Wow. Uh, well, I grew up in a pretty musical household. My grandparents were all, were all musical and my parents were both musical and also involved in musical theater. So they were singing and playing instruments and, and we would hear everything on our record player ranging from Prokofiev to Barry Manilow. My mother would frequently be playing piano and at family gatherings, we would sing a lot. Of course, living in Northfield and my mother being a fourth generation Oli, uh, we would go to concerts at St. Olaf all the time. So all kinds of choirs and, uh, of course, the orchestra and the band. Mm -hmm. And at some point, something clicked in me, and I was looking at those awesome college students and thinking, I want to do that. Was that... Um Concert band in particular, or, or you just knew from performing that you wanted to be involved with an ensemble? I really enjoyed instrumental and vocal music, but at some point, the instrumental started to, to click a little bit more, and maybe because that's a more, a more specialized skill set. Hmm. I remember Miles Mighty Johnson, the director of the St. Olaf Band at that time, uh, he would talk about you have to be a a believable commodity and also a valuable commodity. And I thought I could be more valuable as an instrumentalist than as uh, just a vocalist. Okay. What was your first instrument? Piano, funny enough. Yep. Yep. And I took some lessons from Bob Swanson. Mm -hmm. who, who, who you know, and uh, I was also in the Northfield Boys Chorus, and that was terrific. And I studied with uh, Carolyn Jennings for a while, and she was, she was terrific, yep. And then I started on trumpet in fifth grade, and I really wanted to play trumpet, and Roger Jenny, who is kind of one of my, one of my heroes, um, he said you're a low brass player. And so we kind of butted heads on that. <laughs> and, it, and I was able to do okay on trumpet. But as, as I got older, the high range just was not there. It just didn't happen. And then in ninth grade, I switched to euphonium or baritone horn, some people call it. And then in 10th grade, Leon Hafner convinced me to move to tuba. And then something just kind of clicked. And then I saw Roger not long after. He remembered our interaction from fifth grade and he laughed a little bit and said, I told you, now you're a low <laughs> brass player. <laughs> he was an amazing inspiration for so many people. There's no question. I took drum lessons from Roger yep. Jenny. And his spirit with all ages, but especially under eighth grade. 
Yep. It was just a fire for anybody involved with music. And I yep. bet that he had a sense because of embouchure, you know, shape of the mouth, yep. uh, your breath control, all of those things where at a certain point he knew just by looking what would be a good fit. Yeah. And yes, and I do that as well as a, as a beginning band director. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. And also temperament is another thing. Ah, Some people are are more like the plow horse and other people are more like the show pony. Would you say trumpet players are a show pony? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's lots of trumpet player jokes out there. (laughs) (laughs) All of them (laughs) (laughs) well-deserved. This is fascinating, Mike, and it's helpful to understand the broad palette of your musical experience to know and learn about your musical playing history. So after high school, you went to St. Olaf? Yes. Kind of a big aha moment was there was a three bands concert at the Ordway where the St. Olaf band and the Concordia band out of Moorhead and the Luther band all played at the the Ordway Theater. So I thought this is a great chance to listen to all of those groups and kind of size them up and I thought the St. Olaf band was absolutely just wow. Well, between St. Olaf and now, we have graduate school and we have initial public school teaching, right? Yes. Where was your first job? What led you to that first gig? Okay, so the first job happened first. and, And I got a job at Mayor Lutheran High School. Uh, in this little town of Mayer, which is a little bit west of Waconia, out in Carver County. And I was teaching band five through 12, and that was a one-year position. And then after that, I bounced around in the Rosemount Apple Valley Egan School District for two years. I taught one year at Dakota Hills Middle School, and then through various budget cuts and things like that. Then I took a one year thing as an elementary music teacher and that did not fit me very well at all. I had no idea how to teach first, second and third graders. Mm -hmm. And so that was a very steep learning curve and okay, I I, I tried that. That was, that was a good learning experience. And then after that, I went to North branch that was a very good experience. I got to be in the same place and I was there for four or five years. And by that time, Tanya and I had, had sort of re-met because okay. we, we knew each other through, well, since I was in about third grade. And then we re-met and we started courting, but she was living in Northfield and I was living in North Branch. So that was one factor. And then I was also wanting to get more education and really do kind of a deep dive into the low brass playing and just kind of see what would happen. And so I took a one year of unpaid leave from the North Branch School District after I'd been tenured. And I went back to graduate school at the University of Minnesota full time. And that was a great experience, having been a teacher for several years. And then suddenly I'm back on the other side of the desk. Mm -hmm. And then during the spring of that time, I had heard from my mother-in-law-to-be that Cannon Falls had a band director opening, that their longtime middle school and elementary band director, David Johnson, was retiring. And so I quick whipped up a resume and an application and sent it in and interviewed, and I got the job. They called me on April Fool's Day. (laughs) <laughs> to let me know that I'd gotten the joke, the job, and I thought it was a joke at first. And so that was just perfect because I, I, I love the town of Cannon Falls and always have. Got ready for the Cannon Falls job, and Tanya and I got married, and life has been just swell. This first piece we're going to listen to is a tuba concerto by Edward Gregson. Can you tell us about the ensemble that you're performing with here? Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit of the background and then a a little bit about the ensemble. 
So this was one of the pieces that I had to prepare for my master's degree recital. And it was originally written for tuba soloist with brass band. Okay, so the ensemble is the Lake Wobegon Brass Band, which is based out of Anoka. And it's a lot of high-level brass players, uh, many, most of them from kind of the, the northern suburbs. A lot of good friends are in there. So the instrumentation, if I get this right, it's two B-flat tubas, two E-flat tubas, two euphoniums, two baritone horns, three alto horns, uh, three trombones, including a bass trombone, which, oh, that I love that. And then a flugelhorn, and then a whole bunch of cornets. Let's take a listen. Tuba Concerto featuring Mike Legvold by Edward Gregson. <laughs> Thank you. 
You are listening to Musician Talk. This is Steve Jennings sitting in today for Pauline with our guest, Mike Legvold. You just heard Concerto for Tuba featuring Mike along with the Lake Wobegon Brass Band. Mike, that's full, full full-throated brass playing, not only by you, but by the whole ensemble. And um, can you tell us just a little bit about the difference between a concerto and ensemble playing? Wow, that is a, that's a great question. Well, I consider myself an ensemble player first, second, and third. (laughs) And in a lot of ways, it depends on what kind of group one is playing with. Mm -hmm. So my mind goes back to when I was in college and I was playing in the band and I was one of four tuba players. And then there was also a bass player. And okay, so I've got a lot of people to lean on and they lean on me. And, you know, we're trying to get kind of this homogenous sound between the tubas and then also blend in nicely with all the other instruments in the band. Being the only tuba player in, um, uh, say, a brass quintet or even an orchestra, it's a it's a it's a different mindset. You know, Mm -hmm. you're kind of like Tigger. You're the only one. (laughs) And you still have to work and play well with others and blend in. Um, but there's no one else to lean on. Okay. So you have a, you have a different responsibility, uh, uh, yeah. a soloist responsibility, but again, perhaps the brass band scenario is about the collective sound. Yep. And so you, you have to connect with the, with the blending piece at all times, even yes. as a solo player. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will add that I almost never, being a tuba player, I, I almost never get bored with what I'm playing. Cause I've, I, I try to constantly have my ears engaged so that I'm matching all of these important little things, um, mm-hmm. you know, intonation, balance and blend and, Note length, that's a big one. It is. It is. The, the cutoff, I remember he, seeing a video recently where a trumpet player was talking about the most important thing in a, in a horn section is not the attack, but it's the cutoff. Yep. So meaning the note length. Yep, the release. And then also if you think about the pyramid of sound, you know, where you have a lot of sound on the low end of the spectrum and not so much on the top, you don't necessarily want everyone releasing at exactly the same time. You want uh, your low instruments to kind of feather just a little bit past when the high instruments release. Ah. And sometimes I do that with my own students where we'll release something and then I'll have the high instruments release just a little bit after the, the low instruments are, have released their note. And, ew, that's gross. <laughs> but then we have the tubas hang on just a, just a little bit after the other instruments have released. And, oh, there you go. So it's kind of awesome. subtle. Since we're pinning in on how music, you know, affects our lives and how we can affect music. Tell us a little bit about how music matters to you. Oh, wow. Uh, I think in many cases, music can be the sound of emotion. You know, you even take instrumental music, which does not have the benefit of words. And I won't say all the time, but many times you can get a really good sense of the uh, the emotion or event that's behind it. And when I was younger and I'd go to those, those band and orchestra concerts, I would very frequently close my eyes and kind of imagine, you know, oh, if I'm listening to a movie soundtrack, what would be happening on the screen right now? Mm. And, and that was... Uh, that was kind of a cool way to sort of internalize that. So yeah, it's, it's a lot about communication and connection 
and it's also it also requires some discipline in order to become competent and confident with it and I don't know. One of the things that was very important in my formative years was I was I was fortunate enough to study with Paul Nemisto when I was in high school, mm-hmm. and um, he is definitely one of my heroes. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would frequently play duets, and that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you just had an experience where a musical memory triggered a deep emotion yeah you've used the term mentor several times and i wonder if you could just expand a little bit on that unpack that for us uh the value of a mentor in a young person a young musician's life wow yeah it is uh really important and the uh, i've been very very fortunate to have you know some really positive, impactful adult mentor figures, some really, really great people who, you know, have taken an interest in me and helped me along. And uh, some people where I, I've kind of thought, I would like to be, you know, just a little bit like that person. So maybe there's just a little bit of their aura that I can take and and incorporate a little bit. So, it, it, and I, I, Paul would usually start off a lesson with, <clears throat> with a duet and it just kind of got the, it, I think it, at least for me, it enabled a personal connection and, you know, also kind of warmed up the mind and the body a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I've always enjoyed playing duets with people. It warms up the mind, you said. I, I think that's great. It's it, the other piece that your comment triggered in my mind was this importance of, of listening to somebody outside of yourself. By starting each lesson, it was as if Paul was consciously creating the musical dialogue that allows two people to listen to one another and work together towards something uh, on a regular basis. And there is the heartbeat of perhaps all human communication right there. Yeah. And to uh, react to what the other person is, is doing and communicating. And, you know, there's verbal and nonverbal. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, I remember an interview with uh, Stuart Copeland, you know, He's a, he's a pretty okay drummer, but he said there are musicians, and this one, this one really resonated with me. He said there are musicians of the eye and there are musicians of the ear. Ah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. So a musician of the eye is someone who, you know, you show them music on the page and they will just play it down flawlessly. Mm-hmm. And musicians of the ear, you know, might be a little bit more of your rock musician sometimes where they listen and react. I guess I'd like to think I'm a little bit of both because, you know, I'm always trying to listen to what's happening, but I'm always watching what's happening Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So if I'm playing with... uh, Steve Jennings, I try and keep my eye on what he's doing because if I'm only listening, then I don't have the the full picture of the puzzle that is Steve Jennings. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great segue into our second tune because both you and I are playing on this song. This is Oh, a- wow. Yes. This is a piece by the Wood Brothers. It's called Honey Jar. It's a groove shifting piece. One of the things I really enjoy about it as a musician, as a player, but also as I listen back. And on this particular recording, the two of us lock really, really well with what's going on. And part of that is because we're listening. And the other part of it is because we're watching each other. Amen to that. Yep. Yeah. Here's Sam Ryden and the East Side Collective. Honey jar. <laughs> Oh, 
Guest host Steve Jennings, and you are listening to Musician Talk. We just heard Honey Jar by Sam Ryden and the East Side Collective, performed live at the Burn Pizza Celebration. This group includes Sam Ryden on vocals and guitar, his dad Rob Ryden on shaker and vocals, Craig Wasner on keyboards, yours truly on drums, and our guest. Mike Legvold on bass. And now back to the program. So, um, Mike, that's, that's just so funky. It's so groovy. And the two of us really locked in to a great feel. Let's jump up to what Pauline calls best gig, worst gig. Holy cow. Okay, so um, best gig. There are a lot of ties in this one. <clears throat> That's a tough one. Um, the aforementioned three bands concert at the Ordway was repeated when I was a senior in college, and that was an amazing experience. Uh, playing in the Christmas festival at St. Olaf for the first time was, was a huge wow. The first time ever playing a concert with the St. Olaf band was a huge wow. And then on the rock front, probably the first time I ever got to play with with you and Craig. Another really great gig was uh, uh, a Peter Diggins and Friends gig, and my son Kai got to come up and play some guitar. Sweet. And that was that was way sweet. Oh, that's that's just fine. <laughs> you, you, you have had many fantastic music yes. experiences, and that that's the point. Do you have a worst gig story? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. <clears throat> so first year out of college, I was playing in this rock band with some college friends, and we were playing at Fernando's in Minneapolis on Lake Street. I know the club. Oh, man. And it was kind of scary. And... Uh, you had to bring most of your own equipment in, and the clientele was a little frightening. And someone came running into the place and was was screaming about aliens and uh, jumped over the bar and went after the bartender. And somebody called the police, and they were there in under a minute. Oh, my God. And they had him cuffed, and he was screaming on and on about there's aliens and we have to warn the government and uh, he kind of wasn't feeling any pain. Okay. <laughs> so definitely worst gig right there. Worst gig at Fernando's. I don't think it's there any longer. Um, I played That's there fine. Every, every Tuesday, uh, the summer of 1992. Yeah. So you were well, playing there on Tuesdays. Wow. I must have missed you by, you know, one or two days. Cause this was usually on a, on a Wednesday or Thursday, I think. <laughs> Really delightful, Mike Legvold, uh, to, to get some time to talk with you about your music history and your musical experiences and how you feel about music and how it has impacted your life, with whom you're playing, uh, what's on the docket now that perhaps in the next six months of time, if all goes well, we can see some live music. Do you have any streaming things coming up? 
No. Um, well, I play in the Zillionaires, you know, Wendy Smith and David Drentlaw, and then uh, Peter Nelson is the lead guitarist, and he's from Minneapolis, mm -hmm. but well deserving of a mention. We just did a live stream uh, from the Northfield Arts Guild, so I think you can find that on on the YouTubes and also if you search for it on the Northfield Arts Guild website, you can see that. Well, if you come to a, a band concert at Cannon Falls Public Schools in May, you can see me there. What are those dates? It's the Thursday and Friday in May. I want to say it's the 20th and the 21st. Okay. Will these be outside? No. So because of the COVID restrictions, the audience might be limited. We have been able to do some concerts this year with only two guests per performer allowed. Okay. Then um, my friend Steve Paoli is putting together a little thing uh, at the Cow on April 30th with a band called Amzi Strickland. And we're going to play on April 30th and then again on June 17th. I'm not June, really doing June a whole... Bug? Yeah, I believe that is June Bug. Yep. And there might be, and I might be playing with Peter Diggins and Friends. Yeah. So not much live music out there right now, but I hope that will change in the summer. Yes. Me too. Mike Legvold, thank you so much for being on Musician Talk. It's been a pleasure visiting with you today. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for having me, Steve. This has been really fun. Many thanks to Mike for joining me for a compelling conversation this morning. And heartfelt gratitude to you for listening to Musician Talk on The One KYMN. Have a terrific day. <laughs>